Good day, denizens. We've been talking about nationalism in Europe. Today, we turn our attention over to nationalism in non-Western countries, uh, including China, India, and Japan, and then in another country that stretches both Asia and Europe and Russia, and essentially to look at how these countries, um, how their nationalistic movements compare and contrast with the Europeans, but also how the Europeans greatly affected the nationalist movements in these places. And um, so we start with China, and in China we have a rather interesting uprising <clears throat> led by this guy Hong Yaquan, um, who becomes convinced that he is the brother of Jesus Christ um, and leads a rebellion that gathers about 30 million people. Let's get to that. So the Qing Empire, which ends up being the last empire of China, you know, had a major you know, economy with all the American food crops coming over, which had created a huge population. Just look at the numbers there. In 1685, 100 million people. A couple hundred years later, not even a couple hundred years later, um, we've got 430 million people. So this is a massive population increase, um, you know, has to coincide with efficient government um, and, you know, a good distribution of, of food and availability of food. But the problem is there was no industrial revolution in China like we saw in Europe. So this vast population increase wasn't really accompanied by an industrial revolution uh, or really even an agricultural revolution, even though uh, China did focus on agriculture. Um, so basically we had, you know, smaller farms uh, that had to serve China's massive peasant population. So we're going to see a lot of unemployment, uh, you know, famine, uh, starvation, just misery across the Chinese countryside. And, you know, the great centralized bureaucracy of, of uh, scholars, scholar bureaucrats, you know, um, it, it didn't really enlarge itself enough to really keep pace with this growing population. And here you have a witness in China, uh, who wrote, uh, day and night soldiers are sent out to harass the taxpayers. Sometimes corporal punishments are imposed upon tax delinquents. Some of them are so badly beaten to exact the last penny that blood and flesh fly in all directions. In other words, the Chinese government uh, getting desperate to collect more money, more taxes, you know, sending out government officials or government peoples uh, who then exact pretty harsh punishments on the Chinese population. It's not going to make a lot of friends. And, of course, we also know the issue of all the opium pouring into China uh, in the early and first half um, of the 19th century, uh, which is also going to greatly affect uh, Chinese culture, the economy, and all that, and uh, greatly enrich the British. And, of course, this is the era of the Great Divergence by the 1800s, where Britain will surpass China. Uh, China will be on the decline economically, uh, whereas Britain will be on the Great Incline. And we talked about the uh, opium issues. Here you can see a uh, famous picture of an opium den, uh, which means that you know people in uh, Chinese culture uh, are laying around, you know, doing this instead of working. So it makes the and essentially we talked about the the spheres of influence uh, that uh, emerge all over China. And basically, wherever you see these colors uh, representing a country, uh, that money is going to be removed um, out of China and go to that particular country. Um, and on top of that, you can see issues uh, with Islam in China beginning to rise up, as we talked about earlier this school year, uh, especially in the far western provinces of China, where we had a large Muslim population. So China not in the best of shape as we roll through the 19th century. We're going to see a lot of rebellions. So we get this guy here, Hong Yaquan, uh, who is actually going to form his own uh, cult, essentially, and movement um, in China. And it's in response to the terrible condition and situation China finds itself in, um, you know, the, the opium issues, uh, people becoming addicted to that, um, the... Um, you know, state of affairs in terms of being taken over uh, economically by other countries, the corruption within the government. The Chinese people just finally have enough and they begin to join this guy and what comes to be called the Taiping Rebellion. 
Um, it's the largest rebellion, certainly in Chinese history, perhaps in world history, um, which is it's basically from about 1850 to 1864. So to put that in perspective, uh, over the United States, um, the United States is moving toward a civil war. Uh, 1864 will be the um, uh, what third year uh, of the Civil War, American Civil War. Um, just to put that in perspective, but yeah, this is the largest uprising of mid 19th century China, uh, which nearly overthrew uh, the Manchu Qing Dynasty. Remember, the Manchus uh, were the ones in charge of the Qing Dynasty and thus of China. Uh, the leader of the Taiping Rebellion was this guy Hong Yiquan, uh, who was born in Guangdong Province uh, in southern China to a poor family uh, belonging to the Hekka, which was a group within the Han ethnic majority that speaks a different dialect and practices its own customs. Hong was able to gain an education, but failed in several attempts to pass the examinations uh, in Canton for a position in the imperial bureaucracy. Uh, while in uh, Guangzhou, uh, he was given pamphlets written by the first Chinese convert to Protestant Christianity. In 1837, Hong became ill, fell into a trance, and had dramatic visions, uh, but he recovered and became a village school teacher for six years. I wonder why he went crazy. In 1843, he read the Christian pamphlets, which caused him to announce that he was the younger brother of Jesus Christ and that he had been commanded by God to destroy pagan idols and bring people to worship the true God. After Hong studied uh, Christianity for two months um, with an American Protestant uh, missionary in Guangzhou, uh, he began destroying ancestral tablets in Confucian temples, uh, which angered many Chinese, although some joined his cause. Hong and his followers moved uh, to the north um, Jiangsu province, uh, where they converted thousands to their movement, most of them belonging to the Hakka, Miao, Yao, ethnic minorities, uh, women as well as men. And Hakka and minority women uh, did not bind their feet, uh, as did Han Chinese women, so they were able to march and fight. Uh, in three years, 30,000 converts joined Hong's movement, um, which he called the Worship God Society. Uh, he preached that God had called him to establish the kingdom of God on earth by overthrowing the Manju dynasty. So what contributes to the popularity of this movement, um, you know, China had suffered in the middle of the 19th century, uh, terrible natural disasters, floods, droughts uh, that caused, you know, wide famine. And in addition to that, Great Britain, other Western powers had, you know, defeated the Qing in the Opium Wars and forced them to open several Chinese cities and ports uh, to foreign traders and residents. So this disrupted the Chinese economy and put many Chinese laborers out of work. In September of 1851, Hong claimed to found a new dynasty and took the title Heavenly King, um, Tian Wang or Tian Wang, uh, or uh, sorry, Heavenly King of the Heavenly Kingdom of Great Peace, uh, the Taiping. Um, and he also awarded the title King to five other Taiping leaders and appointed one of the kings, uh, a general, as commander in chief. Uh, he advocated many radical social reforms that alienated the Confucian-educated Han Chinese uh, scholars uh, who staffed the imperial government. He claimed that the Taipings would establish a new order in which peasants owned and farmed the land in common. Money, food, and clothing would be shared equally. Women would be equal to men. And many practices that caused the Chinese great suffering would be eliminated, including slavery, concubinage, arranged marriage, foot binding, prostitution, opium smoking, and torture by legal officials. Although men and women were strictly segregated, many women fought in Taiping battles and held official postings in the Taiping government. But as always goes with these types of movements, um, Hong himself is not going to be, um, I guess, the friendliest of characters or uh, most moral or ethical of characters. So in 1852, Taiping forces marched north uh, through Hunan province uh, and east down the Yangtze River Valley, and thousands more impoverished peasants and revolutionaries joined them. By March of 1853, the Taipangs had captured Nanjing, or Nanking, uh, the capital of the Ming, uh, and southern capital of the Qing on the Yangtze River. Uh, there they established a uh, new headquarters called the Heavenly Capital, uh, Tianjin. Um, by this time, the Taipings numbered more than one million. Hong lived like a king in seclusion uh, in his palace in Nanjing, accompanied by concubines, despite his own teachings. Although the Taiping captured 600 Chinese walled cities and they sent an army north toward the um, Qing capital at Beijing, uh, 
um, altogether, sorry. Uh, in 1855, the Yellow River caused destructive floods in northern China uh, when it changed its course, as it had done many times before, and made its way to the sea north of the Shandong Peninsula uh, rather than south of it. So the Taiping sent north uh, were defeated by Qing forces uh, in Shandong in 1855, partly because the southern Chinese soldiers were not used to the uh, cold northern winter weather. Uh, the Taiping sent another army west to gain control of Jiangsu uh, and numerous other provinces, uh, but this army was opposed by forces raised in Hunan uh, by a Han Chinese government official, um, Seng Kilfan. Um, Basically, you know, as Hong Yiquan became more reclusive, uh, Taiping, uh, another Taiping king ended up taking over uh, and took power into his own hands. Um, as a matter of fact, in 1856, this guy plotted to overthrow Hong Yiquan, uh, but another king assassinated that particular guy and murdered thousands of his supporters. <clears throat> the Taiping king and military commander, um, Shi uh, Takai, uh, put an end to the slaughter and left the Taiping movement in, in disgust. Uh, these events divided and weakened the Taiping, go figure. Uh, in 1860, uh, the Qing appointed uh, an imperial commissioner and governor uh, to basically go in and start taking out um, some of these um, Taiping forces uh, and, and government systems. Uh, the success of this army that went in uh, increased the power um, of uh, locals, other Han, and greatly weakened the Manchus. Um, but forces were assisted um, by the volunteer Chinese and Western uh, Ever Victorious Army, as they called it, led by the American Frederick Ward Townsend. When Townsend was killed in 1862, the Englishman Charles George Gordon took his place. Initially, Westerners had been hopeful about Hong's Christian ideals, but they soon realized that his religion was actually a dangerous revolutionary movement, and they preferred to keep the Qing government in power because it was weak and could be manipulated to their advantage. In other words, the West gets involved uh, to defeat the Qing Empire because the West realizes uh, they want money out of China. But nonetheless, just a, a very bizarre movement. Um, you know, when, when it was all said and done, um, Hong had committed suicide in June of 64. Uh, his son and successor escaped from Nanjing but was later captured. Uh, none of the Taipings surrendered when they were surrounded. They were all slaughtered or burned to death. Uh, during the 14 years of the Taiping Rebellion, more than 30 million people were killed in China. Uh, just a terrible rebellion, um, and other rebellions are going to break out as well. Uh, so it really gives you the idea of just how terrible, um, you know, things were in China, culturally, politically, um, economically. Um, but that being said, the Taiping Rebellion is very critical because it becomes a major source of ins inspiration uh, for Mao Zedong, uh, who will later become chairman of the Communist Party uh, and create the uh, People's Republic of China, uh, under you know so-called communism uh, in 1949, and that was taken from the Encyclopedia of China. Good stuff. <clears throat> so basically, this goes through um, essentially what we just read through, just a little bit more um, straightforward here. Some of the notes on it, um, just giving you reasons uh, for the Taiping Rebellion and why it failed. Be sure to read through those. Uh, but the big thing to point out, too, is that, you know, women played such a huge role. You had women uh, leading armies as generals in this this Taiping Rebellion, you know, which obviously was highly unusual uh, because of this belief amongst the Taiping in this, you know, equality, uh, regardless of, of gender uh, or wealth, didn't matter. And here you see a typical punishment that the uh, Qing government would place upon uh, Taiping prisoners. And this just talks about Hong Yiquan and the dream and that interesting story. And this talks about the rebellion that we just went through. Um, now, men and women, they were actually segregated for administrative and residential purposes. Um, but that being said, you know, women were allowed to serve in the Taiping army or bureaucracy uh, once they passed a spiritually based exam. They had to prove their spirituality. <clears throat> 
Um, and if you were a convert, uh, you couldn't consume alcohol or opium or indulge in any, quote, sensual pleasure, no arranged marriages, no foot binding. Uh, but the problem is the leader of this thing, Hong Yaquan, violated many of those principles himself. And, you know, I mean, this is really a, a communist-like movement, right? This redistribution of wealth. This is a radical, radical you know, movement uh, economically and socially uh, that may have made uh, good old Uncle Carl proud. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Um, but, you know, dividing up the land according to, you know, family need, uh, men and women, you know, receiving equal shares and in, in ownership and things like this. So it's, it's this attempt at an egalitarian social order. So it's an attempt at this egalitarian social order. And you can just see some of the terrible things that the Taiping did. Uh, 1853, they captured Nanjing, systematically killed Manchu men, women, and children, uh, saying that they were, quote, demons in the city. Um, once Hong, you know, is... <clears throat> Is killed. It, there's there's varying accounts. Either he committed suicide or he was killed. Either way, he's gone by 1864, uh, and his body was wrapped in a yellow shawl and thrown into a sewer. Yeah. And there's an interesting clip there. It's just I don't think it's very long, but kind of gives you an idea of the armies in the field at the time. So a nice little overview there. Uh, ultimately, the language of revitalization used by religious prophets in Islamic areas and China during the 19th century provided an alternate vocabulary and outlook for political and spiritual legitimacy. So in other words, and we didn't really talk about Islam at this time, a new version of Islam comes along too called Wahhabism, um, which it just gives a different outlook and different understanding of Islam uh, to find a more spiritual connection. Uh, but also um, more commitment to uh, things like jihad, um, but also um, fatwas and um, you know, declaring um, conflicts uh, against any perceived enemies of Islam. So, so these kind of new movements are greatly in response to the changing times of the 19th century uh, and this, this European empowerment and trying to conquer the planet. And then we have India. So looking over at India, uh, we get some um, wild things going on there as well. Remember, it was the British East India Company that had controlled much of India for quite some time, you know, 100 some years, um, and it exploited India for its resources and also was making profit off of India uh, numerous ways, but most especially by uh, using opium out of India uh, to sell over to the Chinese. And it's important to point this out, too, and this, this could appear on the AP exam. Uh, I'd say it's likely. Um, we start to see this kind of new artistic movement uh, emerge out of Europe based upon European encounters with um, uh, the other, as they would have said. Um, basically, this new European artistic genre uh, known as Orientalism develops, where basically the Europeans view anyone who is not white European, quote unquote, superior, um, is seen as oriental or of the orient. Um, so basically, um, what you see this art doing, just in these two paintings down here, uh, people who are non-Western are seen as sensuous, you know, basically run by kind of their senses and emotion, that they're backward, uh, that they're exotic, uh, that they're whimsical, uh, you know, that they, they do things on a whim, that things aren't really well thought out. Um, so basically people who were not white or non-European, they were always depicted as the other. So basically they fell further under U.S. or European control and Europeans felt more obliged to think of them, uh, the other, as lower or lesser races. So basically, you know, Orientalism is fundamental to social Darwinism and imperialism. And just as an example, you can see in the Serpent Charmer, the painting down there on the left, you know, um, this young boy, it looks like in some, you know, maybe the Ottoman Empire somewhere, some Arabic speaking place, uh, you know, the kid is nude, um, you know, facing these men leaning up against a wall um, who, you know, they don't have any modern, um, you know, modern uh, technology, right? Um, they, you can tell that the wall in the background, it looks kind of dilapidated and worn down. 
Um, and this, this whole idea of, you know, charming wild animals is something that, you know, uh, lesser beings would do. You know, that's what the Europeans would say or point out. Um, so you can tell in the art, you know, how the Europeans unfortunately viewed uh, other peoples. Okay, so the East India Company, uh, by 1857, the East India Company's rule in India uh, had been in place for over 100 years, uh, and it had become very autocratic. Um, now, what the Europeans would do, the East India Company, is they would also try to recruit, you know, Indian people from India, um, you know, Hindu folk, to also, you know, have some type of authority over regional provinces. But in order to do that, what they would do is they would ship folk from India uh, back to Britain uh, to receive an education in English and, and you know, British customs and, and you know, British sciences and, and literature. Um, I mean, in a sense, you know, basically trying to uh, anglify them, I guess, you know, make them, um, in a sense, more British. Uh, so that when they come back, they're almost kind of, I don't know, in a sense, brainwashed, I guess, uh, to to support the, the British cause or the East India Company cause. Uh, but in the 1840s, the company um, increasingly took over more land. Uh, they increasingly took um, land and privileges away from, uh, you know, uh, native uh, aristocrats who had lived in India. Uh, they started collecting taxes directly from peasants, uh, bypassing, you know, Indian tax collectors. Um, it transferred judicial authority away from the indigenous elite. So in other words, the company is taking away power from the people who had held power for quite some time in India. This, you know, so you have a foreign British company coming in and taking away power of people in their own home country. And, uh, you know, by 1856, the company violated treaty obligations, uh, tried to annex a particular province that they weren't supposed to. Um, and at the same time, the East India Company had its own military force. So, I mean, imagine that. Imagine like, uh, you know, Microsoft having its own army uh, to control uh, a, a large country somewhere on Earth, right? Um, and this indigenous military force was known as sepoys. Sepoys, simply a soldier. But the sepoys uh, were made up of a couple of religious groups, predominantly Hindu and Muslim. Well, 1857 is a huge turning point uh, because what's going to happen is there's going to be a massive uprising. Now, the company itself, East India Company, they had had a program. They were building railroads, telegraph lines, postal networks uh, to unify its domains. So this was bringing you know technological innovation to India, right? I mean, they have railroads now. They got telegraph, they got communication. But the problem is those things weren't built to serve India. Uh, or the Indian public. Those things were built to serve European economic, or rather, more specifically, English East India Company economic interests. Basically, you know, the goal was to make India into this colonial capitalist economy um, to feed Britain, basically. But in 1857, uh, things go awry. Uh, the revolt begins when the company army um, native recruits uh, basically rebel against what they perceived as religious insensitivity. Uh, this was the, the so-called greased cartridge controversy. What it was was this. So the East India Company <clears throat> began handing out uh, a new rifle to the sepoys. And remember, these sepoys were Hindu and Muslim. Well, the rifle came with a, a cartridge uh, where the gunpowder had or was surrounded within a wax packet. Well, uh, back then, to shoot a gun, you would, you know, peel back uh, with your teeth uh, to tear open uh, the um, the gunpowder cartridge, and then pour the gunpowder into the barrel of the gun, put in the bullet, and you could fire. Problem is, <clears throat> they used animal fat to grease the cartridges, um, namely pig and cow fat, which is a problem uh, for both Muslims uh, and Hindus, right? I mean, cow is sacred. Um, for Hindus, uh, the pig is disgusting uh, for Muslims. They don't consume pork. So um, once the sepoys heard of this, uh, they just absolutely freaked out. Now, the company realized its mistake and they were just kind of had this, you know, oh crap moment. And they're like, oh, whoa, okay. So sorry about that. <laughs> you know, and they canceled the program, but it didn't matter because at this point, you know, already there was all kinds of distrust, uh, distrust from or between, you know, the company 
and native peoples. Uh, so basically, this uprising ensues. Uh, basically, you know, to the sepoys and to the Indian people, this just proved in their minds that you know the British truly didn't really care about them. Right. Um, and two, basically, these soldiers rose up and they tried to say, look, no, the authority of the Mughal emperor, um, he needs to have more power. He needs to be put back in charge. There was still a Mughal emperor, uh, but of course, he held no real power. And this rebellion gets really, really bad. So you can see all these areas, <clears throat> mostly in northern India, uh, where we have these huge uprisings and basically it was it was terrible. Um, <clears throat> the Indians were convinced that the British were doing things like pouring animal pig fat and cow fat down you know, wells of water. So basically, the Indians were convinced that they were now drinking fat. You know, uh, it's not true, uh, but you know, sometimes uh, fiction uh, causes, uh, or I guess people tend to believe fiction more than they tend to believe truth. Um, and sometimes that's what's most important because that's what happens here. So basically, uh, British citizens who had begun to move into India, uh, they're just massacred uh, in their homes and their villages and their towns. Uh, and the British, you know, they respond and the British come out and they are absolutely brutal as well, uh, massacring sepoys and, and other citizens as well in India. Um, instances of the British, you know, beheading uh, soldiers. Uh, instances of uh, the British Army um, forcing sepoys to lick up the blood of other dead soldiers. Um, just just terrible uh, what goes down here in the so-called sepoy rebellion. But to India, you know, this is their war of independence, right? They're trying to b break away from the British. They finally had enough of, you know, being under foreign control. Um, so this was really the first Indian War of Independence, as they would have looked at it. Uh, to the British, it's a terrible uprising that needs to be put down. And just some of the imagery uh, from the uprising. And some famous stories come out of, of this uprising, including uh, the Rani of Jhansi. Um, a, a Rani is a, a queen, uh, Indian queen. Uh, in this case, uh, this woman here, uh, Lakshmi Bai, um, led this uprising in the province of Jhansi uh, and actually became a military leader um, to resist British rule. And she's she's kind of the kind of a Joan of Arc, I guess, uh, of sorts. Um, who, who becomes this cultural icon in India, the Rani of Jhansi. Um, you'll see some interesting cartoons and television series uh, that you know are in India in the present day uh, that are still very influential in India uh, culture um, because of the popularity of this and you know what this um, lady was able to do in her leadership. Uh, she ends up getting killed um, in 1858, just a year after the start of the uprising, but nonetheless, I think she's only like 29 years old, sadly. Um, but, you know, she, she refused to surrender uh, to the British and she rode into battle and she, you know, was this great inspirational leader who got her people to resist British rule up in northern India. So pretty cool. Um, and, um, you know, she, she becomes this cultural icon uh, in India. And if you check out a couple of those cartoons or television series, you'll see that she still is very much um, a cultural icon. So yeah, so so the revolt itself, um, basically, you know, this thing was, uh, this thing spreads quickly, right? Peasants, artisans, religious leaders, all, all these people, even the gentry, join in. Um, so we're actually unifying Hindus and Muslims, uh, which is kind of unusual. Um, but you know, basically, peasants would come out; they would attack anything uh, that seemed to. Uh, show company rule, right? Uh, indigenous money lenders, uh, people who own land who profited from the company rule. I mean, they would kill these people, attack these people. Um, and really, you know, overall, the revolt was a series of revolts um, where, you know, you had local people trying to settle local grievances and some bitterness and anger that had been around for quite some time. But the problem with the Sepoy Rebellion, besides it's obviously it's terrible brutality, uh, was that it was never a unified movement, right? So um, there was never a India-wide 
you know, unification of peoples uh, to overthrow British rule or, or even company rule. So, you know, on top of that, the revolt didn't really challenge traditional hierarchies of caste and religion. So in other words, even though you have Hindus and Muslims getting along, you know, during this, or more specifically Hindus getting along with Hindus, you know, across, uh, you know, within their religion, the caste systems, you know, still stayed in place. So India couldn't really overcome these, these long held cultural <clears throat> and, and religious social divisions uh, of the caste system. So, you know, there's a total lack of unity with this, which allows the British to put it down. And indeed, it is crushed uh, by 1858. So about a year after it started, the British have destroyed this movement. Um, the Mughal dynasty uh, is, is finally gone. Uh, they execute uh, Mughal family members, they um, throw, put people into exile, uh, they destroy villages, set them on fire. Uh, there were instances where the British actually took some of the rebels, tied them to the ends of cannons and fired the cannons. Um, just terrible what the British, you know, do putting down this rebellion. But basically what happens is, you know, a, a full year after the rebellion, the British parliament decides that, okay, no more company rule in India. There's no more East India Company rule in India. Now the British crown itself will take it over. And India will come to be known from the British perspective as the Raj or the reign. Um, and basically, in other words, this is the British government directly taking over India uh, and controlling it. And basically Queen Victoria, who's the queen at the time, um, she becomes the queen of India. And, you know, when she comes in, she declares religious toleration. Uh, she calls for, you know, improvements uh, technologically and in terms of communication and transportation. Um, and she actually tries to allow some of the, you know, more local leaders to, to have some power. But, you know, any type of trust between India and Britain is, is really crushed, obviously, with this uh, Sepoy Rebellion. But now the British own India directly, the Raj. Okay, and I think we, uh, so there we have China, we have India, it's a lot of information. Um, we talked about Japan and industrialization uh, previously, so I think that we can um, go through this. There are some differences, but overall what you need to know about the Meiji Restoration is that uh, Japan is forced to open. Uh, Commodore Matthew Perry comes in there in the 1850s. Um, and when the Japanese witness, you know, these these steam driven uh, iron hauled ships, the Japanese come to the realization of, uh oh, you know, we, we have to um, we have to do something here. And they understand most Japanese that, you know, the old way of doing things isn't going to work in this industrialized world. But in Japan itself, I mean, there are some major, major disagreements. Right. I, I mean, it's not easy to just say, OK, let's erase you know, a thousand some years of culture and just start over and do whatever the Westerners are doing, right? Not everybody's just going to lie down and accept things for how they are. But, you know, like China, they're forced to, you know, deal with Western powers. Uh, but, you know, for the Japanese, they're kind of lucky in the sense that at least they have an example, right? They can say, huh, well, we know what we don't want to be. We don't want to be China, which is being taken over, right? Um, so basically, you know, Japan has to kind of overcome this this ancient past of, you know, shogun um, rulers, uh, well, the shogunate um, and samurai and this type of thing and and become a more westernized military power. There is good old Commodore Matthew Perry. Um, basically, they forced Japan to sign uh, the Treaty of Kanagawa. Um, and basically, this treaty, is, it's very embarrassing uh, to the Japanese. Basically, they have to let U.S. ships come in. Um, they have to let the U.S. have a consulate. You know, basically, uh, I mean, put it in perspective. We're talking, you know, for a long, long time, uh, the Japanese had not allowed anybody to come in. I shouldn't say anybody. The Portuguese had come in. Uh, the Dutch had been in sparingly as well. Um, but overall, you know, Japan had been very isolated uh, from the rest of the world. Um, and now all of a sudden, the U.S. comes in there and Japan has to let them have a consulate, you know, a, a building on Japanese land. So this is a huge change for the Japanese. 
and here you'll see um, you know the Meiji Emperor uh, who comes in um, wearing Western dress, right? I mean, you never would have seen an outfit like this in Japan prior to the West coming in there. But this new enlightened rule, um, basically what comes here is uh, this, this new government, despite all of the um, you know, debates in intellectual circles and, and public circles about whether or not Japan should you know, move forth with this type of industrialization, you know, basically that's, that's what's going to happen, and they have to. And the thing about Japan is that they're going to industrialize in no time and become an imperial power in no time. Um, and we're going to see the rise of, of the so-called Zaibatsu. Uh, the Zaibatsu are these powerful banking and industrial families who, who loan money, uh, earn money, create businesses like the Mitsubishi family um, and some of these others that uh, are going to become very wealthy um, and, and really run this Japanese industrialization. Uh, and the Japanese just mimic what already exists. You know, why reinvent the wheel? For their government, they look at Imperial Germany, which has a very efficient government. Uh, for the military, look at the British Navy. You know, if you want a strong Navy, mimic them. You want a strong army. Prussia has one of the strongest land armies on the planet. Mimic how they train their soldiers and, and organize their soldiers with regiments and everything else. And, you know, even the children are starting to convert over to, you know, the West. And the thing is, you have to understand, too, from the Western perspective, the Japanese would be, quote unquote, inferior, right? Um, so when the Japanese uh, become this industrial power, the West is kind of like, wait a second, that doesn't fit social Darwinism. That can't be true. Uh, yes, it is. Um, it, here's just, you know, for example, an 1878 song composed for Japanese school children um, <laughs> that impressed upon them the, the 10 objects their country should adopt from the West uh, to be truly modern. And they would sing as they bounced the ball uh, about these, these things here uh, being modern. And then another example of the Japanese adopting, you know, Western ways, Western traditions, uh, you know, this building here, uh, the Rokomiken, uh, this is a place where they would hold like, you know, fancy balls and things like this for um, uh, wealthy Japanese, uh, I guess aristocrats, you could say, uh, or Japanese officials. And basically, the Japanese come to the realization of, look, unless we you know, look like the West, we're not going to be respected by the West, and we could be taken over, right? So you, you have Japanese officials coming to balls like this, wearing you know, frock coats, top hats, uh, cutting their hair short, you know, looking European, right? Uh, Western-style uniforms, military uniforms. Um, and, you know, you would go like to this building here, this westernized building, uh, you'd play billiards, you know, shoot some pool, um, have a fancy ball and, you know, have some western music and drinks. Uh, and believe it or not, their wives would go with them. Hey, how about that? So we actually see a change in uh, Japanese culture and society as well, where women now are becoming, you know, allowed to come more out in public with their husbands. And basically, you know, we see new education uh, spread all across Japan, vocational, in other words, um, kind of hands-on uh, jobs, um, electrician, plumber, things like this, very important jobs, uh, technical agriculture, new universities begin to, to grow up. Um, we have a lot of industries that are started by the government, uh, but then are, you know, sold to investors like Mitsubishi and Kawasaki and others. Um, and basically, you know, private enterprise and innovation was greatly encouraged, very much like Britain when they started their industrial revolution. And the overall goal was to make sure that Japan would survive and not be taken over by the West. Uh, they, they would hire, you know, British engineers to come in and help build railroads. And the thing is this, Japan becomes an imperial power very, very quickly, and it scares the West to death. Um... You know, basically, Japan starts to say, hey, we need a sphere of influence. And there's a few reasons for this. Number one, it's a buffer. It's a protection zone, right? If you can spread out further and you get attacked by the West, who you don't trust, and rightfully so, as Japan, you know, those 
exogenous um, territories, those far further out territories, they get hit first so that you can protect the mainland, right? And then on top of that, Japan looks at places like Britain and Germany and France, the United States, and they say, hey, you guys are allowed to have an empire. Why can't we? <laughs> right? It's really that simple. Um, so basically, you know, what Japan tries to take over are things like the Korean Peninsula, Manchuria, much of eastern China, islands all the way out into the Pacific um, that will, you know, stretch all the way out to World War II and the attack on Hawaii. <clears throat> um, but the first real war um, that we're going to see the Japanese fight, the first, you know, imperial war uh, by the Japanese is the Sino-Japanese War, 1894, uh, where the, the Japanese come into China and just wail on the Chinese, sadly. And remember, you know, that's because China is just so weak uh, from numerous rebellions that they had had. Um, you know, we already talked about the Taiping uprising. There will be more uprisings, the Boxer Rebellion, which we'll talk about later. Um, for example, so China is just so weak, you know. Um, by the way, Sino, Sino is referring to China. Um Basically, the term China, um, from uh, the European standpoint, um, would be known as uh, Sino, Sina, uh, which comes from a Latin term. Um, with the, you know, what the ancient Romans basically would have called the land Sina, um, and you know, China itself. That term probably comes from the Qing Dynasty. Um, the QIN dynasty, remember the dude who uh, drank all the mercury back in the 200s BCE. Uh, but that's where we get the term Sino uh, from, is from the Latin, um, Latinization basically of the term China, I guess you could say. Uh, nonetheless, so, so the Japanese beat um, the Chinese in a war, then Japan goes to war against Russia in what comes to be called the Russo-Japanese War. And Japan just obliterates Russia. And this is shocking to the Western world because Russia, you know, at least in terms of Moscow and St. Petersburg, these places, Russia is a member of the West, right? They're European, but the Japanese embarrass them in this conflict. Um, the Japanese actually launch a, a major sneak attack at, a, at Port Arthur, um, one that uh, mimics very much what will later happen at Pearl Harbor. But that Japanese sneak attack and the Japanese victory, you know, really shocks the world. Um, as a matter of fact, both sides, though, are so beleaguered by this conflict, Japan and Russia, uh, that basically, you know, they just want to end it. So they actually call on none other than Theodore Roosevelt of the United States, the president at the time, uh, to negotiate the peace, to act as an arbitrator, basically. Um, so um, Japanese and Russian officials meet in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And uh, the Treaty of Portsmouth is hammered out, which actually treated the Japanese very unfairly uh, because Teddy Roosevelt himself was a total social Darwinist. And um, Japan felt very slighted. They didn't get the, the territory that they thought that they would get um, and the recognition that they thought that they would get. Um, so this kind of starts this kind of long chain of events where, you know, the United States – I shouldn't say begins. I mean, it, it began with Perry forcing Japan to open. But we can see this kind of long trajectory of the U.S. and Japan not seeing eye to eye, obviously. Um, another instance, uh, Teddy Roosevelt also is going to allow California uh, to ban Japanese immigration into the United States uh, with the so-called Gentleman's Agreement in 190 – brain doesn't remember. Yeah, I think it was the year after this conflict. Um, but nonetheless, um, so so – U.S.-Japanese relations, not the greatest. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt ends up winning the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for negotiating this peace. Uh, by 1910, though, Japan itself, they've, they've got control of Korea. They've taken over much of southern Manchuria. So Japan is a true force. And you can just see here um, Japanese um, expansion. The other thing you have to understand about Japan, too, is that very much like the English, Anglo-Saxons, um, white folk in the United States or whites in Australia or South Africa, um, the Japanese believe that they are a superior race. <clears throat> they believe that they are superior especially to anyone in Asia. I mean obviously they think they're superior to everyone. Um, but they see Chinese, Koreans, these people as inferior to them. Um, so this is going to lead to a lot of atrocities by the Japanese as well, uh, especially in places like Korea and later on by the 1930s uh, in Nanking, uh, a very terrible incident 
in 1937-38 that will come to be called the Rape of Nanking, which we'll get into with World War II. So, yeah, there it is. So the Japanese viewed their colonial peoples as inferior. Um, so it's kind of, you know, it's kind of interesting that not only did the Japanese adopt, I guess, to an extent, European technology and industrialization ideas, they also adopt, you know, similar European social Darwinist ideas, uh, you know, maybe not. Yeah, you know, I don't. That's not necessarily the reason that the Japanese adopted it. The Japanese believed that their culture was superior. They didn't need the Europeans to, you know, convince them of that. Um, but nonetheless, it is kind of ironic that they develop into this modern imperial power and behave pretty much like the Europeans. And then there's poor Russia. Um, Russia is just very, very backward. We're rolling into, you know, almost the year 1900 with Russia, and they're basically still in a feudal system. Yeah, they get rid of feudalism in the 1860s under Tsar Alexander, but the reality is that most Russian peasants lead a life of, uh, well, peasantry. Uh, Russia is in very, very, very bad shape as we roll up uh, into the end of the 19th into the early 20th century. And there you can see a picture of downtown St. Petersburg, uh, St. Petersburg in the 20th century there, sorry, in the 19th century there, toward the end. So Russia sadly is backward, um, and it was viewed as backward uh, by many um, other European powers. It was just seen as this kind of undeveloped place. Um, there was no real middle class in Russia. Remember, the middle class was important uh, to Europeans, especially industrialized powers, because the middle class became this kind of buffer, right? Uh, because there's a middle class, you're not willing to turn to communism or socialism, right? Middle class is not so bad, uh, but that doesn't exist in Russia. They, there's an elite ar aristocracy uh, and the czar. Um, there's a church, um, the Eastern Orthodox, uh, and then there's everybody else. Um, and, you know, at least into the 1870s or so, 1860s, 70s, you know, you, you have serf labor that's controlled by these elites. I mean, these are issues that the Europeans had resolved, you know, almost 100 years ago relative to Russia, you know, in terms of, of this type of unequal social order. Uh, but Eastern Europe and Russia, it's, you know, itself both very behind. Um, you know, Russia did have a major breakthrough with defeating Napoleon in 1812. Um but even after that, you know, the Russian czar, um, after the defeat of Napoleon, wanted to recreate um, the absolutist system again. Uh, so, so Russia's just, you know, not keeping up uh, with the rest of Europe. You know, I mean, Peter the Great must have just been, you know, rolling in his grave, right? I mean, he made all these reforms at the start of the 18th century. But by the time we get into the 19th, man, Russia is not in good shape. And a lot of that has to do with how their czars uh, behaved and how their czars tried to just hold on to power. Um, you know, Tsar Alexander, who aligned with the conservative powers at Vienna, uh, this is the, the guy who defeated Napoleon, um, he had some minor reforms, but this guy was holding on to absolutism. It's kind of like my Bengals and Mike Brown. The dude just won't let go. Wouldn't you think by the time you're in your mid-80s, you would want a championship and you would just step back and let the pros run the show? Sorry. Anyway, so basically these czars always wanted to hold on to absolutism. And Tsar Alexander, you know, when he dies in 1825, and there's, there's actually some um, conspiracy theories behind his death. Uh, some think that he actually didn't die, that he faked his death uh, and then moved on to just become a monk because he just didn't want to be a czar anymore. Doesn't matter. Uh, his brother Nicholas takes over. And Tsar Nicholas ain't no better. As a matter of fact, he's worse. Um, he tries to retrench the, the czardom. He, he tries to make the position of czar once again um, divine, you know, divine right. Um, you know, he doesn't really, you know, he has some railroads constructed, but nothing major. Uh, and we're, you know, Russia is the biggest country on the planet, man. You got to have some railroads and they're not going to have them until the 1890s with the Trans-Siberian Railroad. 
um, he was just paranoid. You know, he, he feared losing power to industrialization. If you industrialize, well, you might lose power as the czar, right? Um, he would send uh, spies, you know, monitors into the universities to watch the teaching. Um, and when they got industrial goods, you know, they were purchased. They weren't made in Russia. They were purchased from the West uh, using money raised from the sale of crops. So Russia and China really have a lot in common in the 19th century, two agrarian societies uh, holding on to the past, and um, it's going to cost them dearly. Um, you know, Russia enters a, a war, the so-called Crimean War, in 1853. Um, and basically, you know, the Ottoman Empire, which is falling apart at this time, they didn't even talk about that, and we will later, but um, Russia goes into this conflict, um, and they just get beat. <laughs> they get beat down. You know, they try to go into the Balkans, but they get beat because Britain and France start arming the Ottomans. And the Ottomans, they're only around essentially because they pay uh, money to the British and the French to allow them to stay around. So the Ottomans aren't in good shape either, but the British and the French don't want Russia to expand into the Ottoman Empire. So what do they do? They help supply the Ottomans with modern weaponry to defeat the Russians. Uh, very similar to how the Europeans helped Menelik II hold off the Italian invasion uh, in Ethiopia in the 1890s. And on top of that, you know, you, you have this kind of Slavophile existence of Russia. A, a Slavophile is someone who um, favors Slavic peoples, like a Francophile, someone who favors French peoples, for example. Like Thomas Jefferson was a Francophile. Uh, he was a big supporter of France and its government, as opposed to people like, say, Alexander Hamilton, uh, who um, I guess was an Anglophile. He supported more Anglican, um, Anglo-Saxon um, societies like Britain. Sorry, that's for next year anyway. But nonetheless, so basically, you know, these Slavophiles, you know, they, they focused on the Orthodox Church, uh, maintaining the peasantry, being dedicated to the czar. So basically, you know, these, these kind of um, aristocratic folk who just won't let go of the past. Um, and they also encourage what we call pan-Slavism. In other words, supporting all Slavic peoples, um, you know, including in the Ottoman Empire or the Austrian Empire. And this is going to play a huge role uh, in the start of World War I. And Russia increasingly is kind of seen as this protector of Slavic peoples with this intense nationalism uh, that's going to help bring it into the First World War. And a little bit on the Crimean War. I mean, you know, obviously a lot of people killed here, but, you know, from our perspective, you know, in terms of, um, you know, what we need to know for, for testing, you know, it began over this idea of, you know, Russia trying to protect Christians going to the Holy Land, right, because Russia is Eastern Orthodox. The reality is Russia just wanted to grab more territory, right? Um, but the point with Crimean War is that it shows just how weak Russia is. And, you know, Russia was an expansive power. They, they, were, all, they were always trying to expand, uh, just like the Europeans were with imperialism. And, um, you know, kind of like the United States, Russia had also, you know, been an imperial power for quite some time, for most, most of its existence, right? Um, and, you know, this expansion, you know, back in the 1500s went pretty well, <laughs> under Ivan the Terrible and later on Peter the Great. Uh, but by the time we get to the 19th century, you know, we have some major European powers like Britain and France, later on Germany, uh, and Russia is just going to be stymied by these powers, Well, in the 1860s, you know, interestingly, why the United States is fighting its civil war, uh, which will, you know, end slavery uh, legally in the United States. Um, you have Tsar Alexander II in 1861, you know, a full year, year and a half before Abraham Lincoln announces the Emancipation Proclamation, Tsar Alexander emancipates the serfs. Uh, he ends forced labor. Uh, he gives peasants some property rights. Um, you know, new ideas come into Russia, right? Um, ideas of freedom and ideas of different types of government and, and how government should actually operate as opposed to having, oh, here we have a king with divine right <laughs> and that kind of silliness. Um, and yeah, like it points out here, you know, President Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, you know, a couple of years after Alexander frees the serfs. So it's kind of interesting to point out how, you know, the, you know every country has <laughs> some backward elements to it, even the United States.
But the problem is, is realistically, even the emancipation of serfs really doesn't do a whole lot for the serfs. Uh, okay, you're free. Now what are you going to do? Okay, I'm going to go back and work on the same land, right? Uh, same thing happens in the United States. You know, the United States ends slavery officially. Uh, but sadly, especially in the South, you see um, you know, Jim Crow laws and you know, restrictions on African Americans. And because they're so poverty stricken, what do they do? They go back to work on the same plantation uh, on which they were a slave, you know, just recently, you know, before the Civil War. Um, but Russia, you know, too, they, they do continue to conquer. But the problem is, you know, Russia is this imperial conquering power, but you really need to be worried about your internal politics, right? Uh, they are going to take over the Caucasus Mountain region um, uh, to their uh, south direction, uh, southwest. Um, well, I guess it depends on how you look at Russia. But, um, you know, Turkestan, some of these places in Central Asia, Russia is taking over. Uh, Russia is also moving way out to its far, far, far east out of Manchuria. So, you know, China is just under double siege, right? They, they got the Japanese coming. Uh, from their east, they got the Russians coming in from their west. So China's in a bad way. Um, the Russians actually sell off this chunk of land they have in North America called Alaska. They sell it to the United States in 1867. Um, and Russia also hires a French company and gets the French to invest and help them build the Trans-Siberian Railroad in the 1890s. And you know, trying to basically link up, you know, Russia over the long term or over this long geographical expanse, uh, very much like the United States did with its transcontinental railroad in the 1860s. But man, Russia's big. I mean, <laughs> how do you unite all of that land? Even a single railroad really isn't going to unite a whole lot. And then imagine trying to lay down railroad in Siberia. I mean, how exciting would that be? Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, Russia's decision to build a railway across Siberia to the Pacific came from, you know, this desire to expand the empire in East Asia and to try to stop British advances in Asia. Uh, but this is a colossal undertaking, you know, and it, thousands of people died building this railroad. Um, and, you know, it's finally completed, you know, just as Russia starts going to war with Japan in the Russo-Japanese War. That being said, I mean... You know, politically, Russia is backward, but culturally, you know, there are brilliant people um, in Russia. Uh, and there's a great literary movement in Russia. Um, Fyodor Dovchetsky, um, Dostoevsky, uh, and Leo Tolstoy, um, they, in their novels, in their writings, you know, they're calling for reform. They're saying, look, you know, um, we have to, we have to fix things or we're going to, you know, explode. Um, and Dostoevsky, you know, focused on uh, the human psyche um, and, and how it was affected by, you know, this kind of tumultuous existence of, of Russia during the 19th century. Um, but the problem is, you know, Russia, it, it stays in this, this authoritarian agricultural past. Leo Tolstoy is one of the most famous um, writers in world history, let alone Russian history. Though many writings were, were banned in Russia, um, Dostoevsky, for example, he was arrested in 1849 uh, because he belonged to a, a, a literary group uh, that discussed banned books that were critical of Tsarist Russia. And he was actually sentenced to death, but he ended up having the sentence commuted at the last moment. Uh, he spent four years in a Siberian prison camp, uh, and then another six years of compulsory military service while in exile. Uh, so, you know, these writers, even though they're coming out with these great works of literature, um, they're very much stifled in Russia uh, in the midst of the 19th and even into the 20th century. I mean, Western Europe has moved beyond this 100 years ago. Um, nonetheless, not that they're not stifling some stuff, but uh, nonetheless, uh, Tolstoy, very famous for uh, his magnum opus, War and Peace, uh, which, you know, you can read that in a couple of days. It's only 1,225 pages. Um, War and Peace is actually considered um, one of the greatest novels uh, of human history. Um, War and Peace, as a matter of fact, Time Magazine back in 2007 did a poll. War and Peace ranked as the 10th best novel of all time. Um, but Anna Karina, uh, another novel that he wrote, which critiqued Russia's feudal system, um, with a love story intermixed, of course, that's considered the greatest novel of all time. 
And there's your first uh, color photograph coming out of Russia, uh, 1908 of old Tolstoy. But overall, so let's make sure that we can compare and contrast you know, nationalist movements in these countries um, and compare them to what the West is doing um, and understand that um, China, Russia falling way, way, way behind, India controlled, uh, but because of this nationalistic movement with the Sepoy Rebellion in India, it's going to inspire more uh, groups to rise up against British rule. In India, we'll see the formation of the Indian National Congress, uh, which will eventually have leaders like guys named Mohandas Gandhi. Um, so India uh, is, is kind of this in-between, I guess, interstitial existence uh, in terms of moving forth. Um, and India is being industrialized uh, by the British, not necessarily for the benefit of the Indians, uh, but still it's getting modern industry because of Britain. Um, and who would I forget? Japan. Japan has become a major power as we roll into the 20th century, a major imperial power with its own ambitions and powers. And that wraps this one up. Man, that was a long one. But hey, four countries. That's not, actually, that's not bad for four countries.